Welcome to The Dark Divide, a podcast that takes a seat, dangles its legs over the edge, and stares into the abyss. This is the story of Sherry Rasmussen. You knew the cost of loving somebody more than they love you. Maybe it was always there in the back of your mind. With open arms, you welcome the sacrifice. Love makes choosing easy. Who could have ever known that it would be dreadful to grow so deeply connected to another? So deeply that your bordered edges blur into seamless. Now you cannot undo the tragedy of a one-sided story. I owed you more than this, but it's only your own voice you hear, gutting the silence for a second, lamenting with half sorrow, half self pity. Why couldn't you have gotten what you wanted? Just this one time. The California sun beat down on John as he used a towel to wipe the sweat from the back of his neck. Stephanie was trying not to stare, but she couldn't help it. He's long, lean, tall, and handsome, but in that boyish and awkward way where he doesn't even seem to know it or care. And most importantly, he's single. Up until now, none of the guys she'd come across on campus were anything special, but John had it all. He was smart, he was driven, well-liked, and athletic. And Stephanie felt like she could let loose and be herself around him. "'Come on, you aren't tired out yet, are you?' she taunted in his direction." He laughed. First to 21 buys the beers for the party tonight? Oh, you're on, sucker. Stephanie quickly snatches the basketball that had been resting on his hip and begins to dribble towards the net, making a perfect shot. She turns around to tease him some more, but John's gaze was fixed off to the side, where a few girls in summer dresses were walking with their books in the direction of the dorms. Their sing-songy laughing, their long hair flowing in the hot summer breeze. It wasn't that Stephanie didn't like herself. She felt like she had a good body, and she kept in shape. She got along with the guys, and plenty enough flirted with her or asked her out. But she wasn't like those delicate girls. She'd never been. Stephanie turned back to the net, ready to make another shot, thinking of the way John had looked at her the first time she'd beat him in a game. So surprised and impressed. Besides, what did those girls have? Her and John were so compatible. He would see it in time. She was sure they'd end up together. She was determined to make it happen, one way or another. Stephanie Lazarus had always been seemingly enigmatic, not even necessarily in an interesting way. She'd had what you would consider a fairly average childhood, the eldest of two siblings in a safe neighborhood with lots of other kids, a California girl, true and true. Saturdays were for sports, A daddy's girl, taking after her father, who'd been somewhat of an athlete himself. She played on a Little League baseball team for girls before venturing elsewhere into basketball and tennis. And Sundays were for family, barbecues and visits with extended family members. Stephanie's nature was inherently independent, and that may have been what carried her through her parents' divorce during high school. It wasn't the most common thing in 1975, but 15 was old enough to at least begin to understand the reality that sometimes things just don't work out. She'd be out of the house in a couple years anyway. Stephanie's younger brother, on the other hand, had been so embarrassed about it, he didn't even mention it to anybody outside the family for a whole year. In the process, the children were asked to choose which parent they wanted to live with. Judy and Steve chose their father, and Stephanie chose her mother. The two would move out and rarely see Stephanie after that. She graduated in 1978 and celebrated that summer by backpacking around Europe with a girlfriend. She had big plans and had worked hard saving up for tuition and applying for small grants and scholarships. It had been important to her family that she attend UCLA, and Stephanie was ready to make the most of it. During her freshman year in the fall of 78, Stephanie met John Rutten, a sophomore mechanical engineering student who lived on the same floor of Dykstra Hall, a 10-story dormitory on campus known to house a lot of the school's athletes. They were part of a big group of friends who all hung out at the dorms, most of them living there as well. Stephanie and John clicked effortlessly, bonding mainly over their love for sports. They'd go for runs together, play basketball, catch the occasional movie. 
John wasn't necessarily suave or anything. He was far from. He'd only had one significant relationship before college, and sometimes his boyish good looks and six-foot-three frame only brought more attention to his awkwardness. But Stephanie found it endearing. Stephanie liked everything about John. Soon it wasn't a surprise to see the two everywhere together. From the outside, most people assumed they were dating or something. They'd made out a few times here or there, keg parties and bar hops. When he was sober, though, John more or less looked at Stephanie as one of the guys more than anything else, telling his friends that she had a great body, but not a good face. Maybe it was her weird sense of humor, her crude pranks, or her slight masculine energy she gave off. She just wasn't the typical kind of girl that most guys around her wanted, and she was okay with that. She invested in her body more than makeup, pulling off a two-piece bikini like the models on the magazine covers. She chose jeans and t-shirts over dresses and tank tops, and almost always kept her hair short enough for it to not require much time or effort. But she could make John laugh. She got his inside jokes. She understood his sports talk. And sometimes, he'd look at her like she was the only girl alive. She was sure of it. She knew she wanted more than he did. She knew she wasn't his girlfriend. But ambiguous was better than nothing, and with some men, Stephanie knew all it took was time. Even though she was only five feet and seven inches tall, Stephanie could hold her own in almost any sport. While studying political science, she made the most of the athletic opportunities UCLA offered her. During the fall of 1980, she joined the junior varsity basketball team. John moved off campus for his senior year, but continued to make the effort to see Stephanie, and was often standing and cheering in the crowds at her games. He would end up graduating the following year, and rented an apartment for himself after landing a job as a computer engineer for a company called Data Products. It was there, one night after a few drinks and a lot of flirting, that Stephanie and John would have sex for the first time, only bringing more confusion to the gray area they both hovered in together. Before graduating, Stephanie had spent a summer interning at the Englewood Juvenile DA office, thinking that she wanted to be an attorney. But by the time she received her diploma in political science and sociology, she was leaning more towards police work. And in February of 1983, she applied to the LAPD. John and Stephanie continued their friendship with benefits type relationship after both of them left UCLA, even meeting each other's families and going away on trips together. They shared sunsets in places like Catalina and Palm Springs, also sharing a bed every single time. John saw other women here and there. And since nothing serious ever came from anything, and things weren't serious with Stephanie either, he never felt the need to mention it to her. They all fizzled out, and Stephanie and John managed to always drift back together, with their strange chemistry and unlabeled dynamic. John knew Stephanie liked him, a lot, but figured that for the most part, they were on the same page with things. She didn't really ever push for more. It wasn't stressful. It was easy. It was just harmless fun between a couple of adults. No big deal. Stephanie had always managed to maneuver her way around male-dominated spaces quite well, so it was no surprise that applying to the LAPD during a time when it was still quite new for women didn't scare her off. Up until the 1970s, women didn't even train alongside men. After a whirlwind of a fight for fair treatment, Stephanie seemed to have applied at the perfect time. In the 1980s, female LAPD recruits were offered eight weeks of paid, specialized, pre-police academy training through the Crime Prevention Assistant Program. This included three hours of physical training daily, as well as weight training, long-distance runs, wrestling, and defense fighting. Eventually, the program's length changed from eight weeks to six months, and by the time Stephanie was hired, the program was in its fourth year. Stephanie excelled and she passed the psychological exam everyone was required to take and successfully wrote up a three-page essay about her employment and educational history. She was a prime candidate for a police officer in LA. She had training in law, she spoke enough Spanish to get by, she had experience with firearms, self-defense, and even though she was only 5'7", she was one of the strongest among the female recruits, even having won wrestling matches with some of the male officers too. She later graduated 24th out of 66 in her co-ed police academy. Her type A personality fit right in with the force. The rest of 1983 played out with Stephanie learning the ropes as a cop in the city and seeing John in her spare time. She bought a two-bedroom condo in Granada Hills, and when John turned 25, she threw him a birthday party at her new place. And that December, she was his date to his Christmas office party. 
Again, they still existed in this undefined and between, but some love stories are like that, Stephanie knew. And besides, half of the time, to her, it felt like they were basically dating anyway. Stephanie worked nights, so she didn't really have a lot of room for venturing out into the dating world or even having a normal lifestyle. And she wasn't really interested in any of the guys on the force or the idea of dating a cop, seeing them more as comrades than anything else. Nobody had ever compared to John. Nobody ever came close. Stephanie was also really focused on her police work. This wasn't just a job, this was a career, and she could see herself going all the way to the top. She was issued the Smith & Wesson six-shot revolver that all LAPD officers use as their on-duty firearm. Most officers like to have a backup, so she bought herself another Smith & Wesson, a Model 49 revolver with a dark blue steel finish. She liked having the best gear and equipment she could, wanting to always look as good and professional as possible. She even spent a few extra hundred dollars on a bulletproof vest specifically designed for women officers, because the ones issued by the LAPD were still designed for men's bodies. She got along really well with her co-workers. She joined the LAPD women's basketball team, some of the other members being women she'd built lifelong bonds with after six grueling months of training together. People liked her. She was usually upbeat and easygoing, but she was also the perfect amount of strong-willed and no bullshit. By the summer of 1984, she was regularly working the Hollywood area and was beginning to really feel confident in her job. She'd also been seeing less of John, who'd apparently started seeing someone else which was fine. She was sure that while she was busy making a name for herself on the force, it would run its course. That fall, she started to keep a diary, mostly jotting down details of her days on duty after work. Who knows? Maybe it would be cool to look back at all these things one day. Maybe she could write a book about it. Even then, seven years before the police brutality event involving Rodney King in 1991, the LAPD had already been no stranger to scandal. Even newbies like Stephanie were already well aware of the blue wall of silence that unspoken code between officers, that you don't rat out another cop. Stephanie had even testified during an internal court hearing involving a higher-up, but she wasn't outwardly interested in LAPD politics all that much, and her diary still was more of a log than anything else most of the time. She was pretty meticulous about the format, always noting the number of the car she'd been in that day, her partner's name, the hours she worked. Stephanie had always been the type to label everything. Every single Polaroid and photograph over the years had its time, place, and person written on it somewhere. Sometimes she wrote about John. She mostly tried not to think about him, because it hurt more than anything. The idea of not being with him hurt more than the memory of her father leaving. In mid-November, she came home from a night out with friends and ended the entry with, It was nice. Kept my mind off John for a while, anyway. And being a cop was aggressively hard work. There was a lot to learn, and also Stephanie was keen on the ins and outs of office culture and workplace politics. She didn't want to just be good at her job. She strived for camaraderie among her peers, and she wanted everyone she knew to really like her. She'd jot down days in her diary when she brought the guys cookies and became known for giving out chocolate-covered cherries around Christmas time. She was thoughtful as a co-worker and persistent as a cop. Where other women struggled to find their footing, Stephanie stood sure of herself, and other people took notice. The new year started off with some relief when Stephanie was switched to days. She'd been really tired and missed having some semblance of a life. Plus, she no longer required to partner with a training officer anymore. While some may have trepidation about starting shifts alone, Stephanie was eager. For someone in their early 20s, she was already quite desensitized to the violence and chaos around her as a cop in downtown LA in the mid-80s. She was assigned her own police car, and would sometimes bend the rules and visit her friends during hours on duty. I mean, it was nice, not only being able to see people during daylight hours again, but walking around in her uniform and badge felt powerful. On May 10th, she came home and wrote in her diary about how she'd stopped by John's place that day, but his girlfriend had been over, so she didn't stay long. Girlfriend. It felt sour to even write the word out. Stephanie had a cruise planned for the following week, a nice vacation away from the intense schedule of work. When the ship docked in San Diego for an afternoon, she spent the day with John's mother, the two smiling for photographs in front of the giant white boat. It's unclear if the two spoke about John, but no doubt he must have come up in conversation. And his mother must have been aware of how happy her son was, because just two weeks later, John would announce his engagement to his girlfriend. Stephanie mentioned it in her diary on June 4th, writing, We didn't really do much. I didn't really feel like working. 
I found out that John is getting married. I was very depressed. This is very bad. My concentration was minus 10. Even Stephanie's roommate at the time, Mike, took notice of how off she was. It wasn't really like Stephanie to be anything but upbeat, but she'd woken him up in the middle of the night crying, and he'd never seen Stephanie cry before. Apparently, John had broken things off with her. He was going to marry someone else, for sure. He was a little surprised because she'd only mentioned him half a dozen times in the long while they'd known each other. She never seemed to make a big deal about this elusive guy named John that she saw once in a while. But she was so upset. They stayed up for over 30 minutes talking together. Stephanie asked if they could do some buddy sit-ups for her to burn off some energy, and it seemed to calm her down. But everything was just a temporary fix, and the pain would return again in its heady waves. Sometimes it was so bad she couldn't even be bothered to go to work, which was rare for Stephanie. On June 16th, she wrote, I didn't really feel like working, too stressed about John. I've had a hard time concentrating these days, so I called up and said I don't feel well, could I have a T.O., and they gave it to me. She thought about John, his smile, his voice, all the moments they'd shared. What was it about this new woman that she didn't have? A friend of John's had invited him over to a house party, and that's where he'd seen her, struck by some Cupid's bow from all the way across the room. She was tall and blonde, the woman laughing in the white blouse with dangly earrings. That's Sherry, and she's single, John's friend nudged him. He knew he had to talk to her. Sometimes it just happens like that. Like fate. And by the end of the night, the two had exchanged numbers, and she'd offered to cook him dinner. Sherry Rasmussen got home from work like a tornado carrying groceries, kindly asking her roommate Jane to scram for the evening. Then she showered, did her makeup, and made beef stroganoff. John brought over a bottle of wine, and the two continued their conversation from the party without missing a beat, talking well into the night, unnoticed hours flying by. They quickly became exclusive and were crazy about each other. John bragged about Sherry to anyone who would listen, and after a few months, Sherry wanted John to meet her family. Although the fathers of the pair would butt heads often, sometimes to the point where it would ruin family dinners. John's dad was a Democrat, Sherry's father Nels, a Republican, and the two just couldn't seem to keep their political feuds off the table. But of course, they'd eventually set their differences aside after blowing off a little verbal steam here and there. I mean, what else was there to do? Their kids were head over heels for one another. So nobody was all that surprised on a Saturday in May when they announced their engagement. John liked to dote on Sherry, especially with material items. Instead of some flashy diamond, he ended up getting her a flashy car. He managed to do so with some down payments, clearing out his savings, and trading in her old Toyota. Everyone thought it was a little much for Sherry, who'd never really been the type to want something so extravagant, but Sherry loved it. Her father was worried about how different the two were when it came to money. John loved to borrow, 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 very much the get-now-pay-later type. His daughter, on the other hand, didn't even really use credit. She'd paid for her apartment furniture in cash after saving up for it, for example. But Nels knew he couldn't baby Sherry forever. The two of them would find their footing eventually, even if it may mean a few blunders along the way. Sherry told Jane that she and John had decided he would move in, but she could take her time finding a place. Jane ended up moving fairly quickly, rooming with another nurse at the hospital. Living together before marriage still wasn't all that common for 1985, so Sherry had mentioned it to her parents almost as if seeking approval. Sherry was a smart girl. She'd always made good decisions. They felt that John was another one of those. Nels transferred ownership of the condominium, and the two were officially homeowners. The wedding date was set for November 23rd later that year. Sherry's sister, Teresa, had been married the same day, five years before, and since the two were so close, they thought it would be such a loving gesture to share something so important. Everything was moving so fast, but that's how it happens sometimes. Sherry and John felt like they were in their own dream world, high on the exhilaration of getting everything you could want and more. Love was in the air. Sherry had been living in her condo for the last six years, 
Her parents had bought it for her while she was studying for her master's degree in nursing at UCLA. She'd worked as a staff nurse during that time to help her pay her way through school. It had always been important for her to maintain some sense of independence. Even though the condo was in her father's name, she sent him a check every month for the mortgage payment. Sherry'd always been close to her parents. As a toddler, she'd been a big mama's girl, but the older she got, the more she seemed to follow suit with her father's ways. Nels and Loretta Rasmussen were a pair of high school sweethearts. Sherry was the middle child of three, and often the peacemaker between her sisters and her parents. She had such a gentle and reasonable way about her. In school, she excelled. Sherry was always at the top of her class. She sometimes felt an insecurity when she compared how much she cared about her studies to the lack of that among her peers, but her parents encouraged her drive to succeed. In sixth grade, the principal of her school said that Sherry could do her seventh grade program over the summer and graduate into high school the following year, practically skipping a grade. She was voted class president and delivered an inclusive and encouraging speech. That display of humble goodwill is something Sherry would continue to be known for among the people around her. You could never resent Sherry for her achievements. She was kind. She worked hard. She deserved them. High school, as well, was a game of skipping grades and filling her workload to keep her challenged and fend off her teenage boredom. Doctor and lawyer talk had obviously been an element of discussion about the future. With grades, ambition, and drive like this, why not seek out such a demanding and well-respected profession? So, medical school was kind of always this goal off in the distance. But Sherry felt torn between medical school and nursing. Nels would constantly remind her what an amazing doctor she was going to make. And it wasn't that Sherry didn't agree. She knew she could do it. She was gifted, not just with smarts, but also with a remarkable ability to be calm in life-or-death situations, remaining focused and unafraid. But she also wanted to start a family one day, and she felt like being a doctor would require her to sacrifice a lot more of her personal time. She also felt like maybe she could just do more in nursing, She liked the idea of having a closer relationship with patients. She wasn't just all brains. Sherry had a huge heart of gold, and not putting it to use somehow in her career seemed wrong. In September 1978, Sherry started her master's in nursing, which included a full-class schedule along with clinical training in the form of nursing shifts at the UCLA Medical Center. Sherry's focus was on cardiac care, and after she received her master's degree in March of 1980, she would become a cardiovascular clinical nurse specialist. Nels still had hopes that Sherry would somehow pivot into medical school. As with all his children, he just wanted Sherry to be the happiest and most successful she could be. Sherry said the only promise she could keep to him about her career was that she would make him proud. And that was, of course, more than good enough for Nels. And Sherry would keep that promise. She ended up earning a promotion as head nurse of the coronary care unit and began managing staff, some of who had been her peers in the beginning. She kept irregular hours, had around-the-clock responsibilities. She did lectures for undergrad students at UCLA School of Nursing, and she loved every minute of it. In 1983, she was awarded Nurse of the Year. And after six years, she applied to Glendale Adventist Medical Care and was hired to begin working as their nursing director at the end of February 1984. Because of her strange hours and demanding job, Sherry's social life consisted mostly of seeing her roommate occasionally and other nurses at the hospital. She didn't date much, unless she considered studying and hanging out dating. She was just intent on finishing her programs, improving in her field, and setting her personal bar higher and higher each time. When she'd had the time, she loved to be outdoors. Swimming, skiing, biking, tennis, anything really. Usually with her family on vacation. Something she'd hoped to have for herself one day a little corner of the world to call her own to come home to. Just seemed impractical and out of reach to even try to find the time to devote to that area of her life. And that night, at the party, she hadn't been looking for anything. But she'd somehow found everything. A perfect match in John Rutten. Things hadn't been so seemingly cut and dry on John's side of things. At least not in Stephanie's view. John only realized how oblivious and naive he'd been after Stephanie had called him one night, crying and begging him to come over because they needed to talk. John had known Stephanie for seven years, and he'd never heard her that upset before. When he arrived, he was taken aback when she confessed that she was in love with him. He was sure he'd been clear in the past about where they stood with each other, that he just 
didn't feel that way about her. And there'd even been times when Stephanie herself had said she was an interest in things like marriage and family, two things she knew John had his sights set on for the future. The pain in her eyes made him uncomfortable to the core. He hated hurting someone so important to him. But he told Stephanie the truth. Their lives were going in different directions. He wasn't in love with her. He was going to marry Sherry. Stephanie continued to cry, and John really didn't know what else to say, so he just held her. Eventually, she looked up at him and asked him if they could sleep together. John, of course, said no, he couldn't. He's engaged to be married. But Stephanie was insistent, explaining if things ended how they started, if she could just have one last experience of being close with him like that. If they had sex, it would give her closure. Please, John, this will be the last time, Stephanie begged, tears streaming down her face. She began kissing him, and John began to kiss her back. Less than an hour later, he would be buttoning his shirt back up and heading home. The smell of bed sheets and shampoo and sweat that wasn't Sherry's, suffocating him with guilt. At least it was over now. But Stephanie hadn't gotten closure that night. If anything, she was more convinced than ever that John didn't know what he was doing. I mean, if this woman was so great and he was so happy, why would he have slept with her? She played cat and mouse for all these years. Maybe she never truly made it clear to him what she wanted. Well, it was time to put her foot down. On one of her days off, in the summer of 85, Stephanie went to the hospital that Sherry worked at. She found the nursing department and marched up to the secretary's desk, wearing tight shorts and a revealing tank top, requesting to see Sherry, who was out to lunch. Stephanie sat down and waited until Sherry returned, who was obviously surprised to see Stephanie waiting for her, and not in a good way. The two went into her office and shut the door. Stephanie left, and soon after, Sherry came out to tell her secretary she was going home. It was only the middle of the day, but she didn't question her. She could tell Sherry had been crying. And that night, the crying would continue on the telephone as Sherry told her father about what happened. This woman, some woman in John's life, had come to inform her that if she couldn't have John, nobody could. She said John had been seeing her, that they'd known each other for years, and she knew John better than anybody. This wasn't going to last. She was what he wanted. And even if he went through with the marriage, it would only be a matter of time until it failed and she would be right there to pick up the pieces. It was all so much out of nowhere, and it hit Sherry like a ton of bricks. It felt like some insane soap opera. What the hell was going on? John hadn't really mentioned anything about his past. He certainly didn't mention anything about ever having a serious girlfriend. And if he was cheating, she couldn't even figure out how. When he wasn't at work, they were always together. But she'd seen a lot of things. A lot of good men make horrible mistakes. Her parents, compared to their friends, were an exception as the divorces piled up around them. And she was heartbroken to find out that it wasn't a lie after all. When she confronted John about it, he admitted to what he'd done right away. Sherry wasn't insecure about Stephanie. She was just disappointed, beyond devastated, that he'd lied to her about seeing Stephanie that night in the first place. If they were going to get married and be together forever... That would only happen if they could be 100% honest with each other. John had been crazy about Sherry since the second he met her, but in that moment, feeling as if he could completely lose her, he realized how careless he'd been and how much this relationship meant to him. He begged Sherry to believe that not only would anything like this never happen again, but he would make sure to cut off all contact with her. Once again, John chose the silent route with Stephanie. Instead of making it clear that he was aware of what she'd done, and to stay away from his fiance, it seems he decided that the best way to go about all of this was just to move on and let Stephanie get the point in time. When Sherry returned to work the next day, she told her secretary that she'd been threatened by that woman, and not to be alarmed, but if she did return, to call security. She didn't tell her friends much about the altercation. Even telling her family had been hard enough. Embarrassing, really. She felt the need to protect John from all the harsh judgments. I mean, if they were going to stay together, what was the point? It would only fuel the fire of any naysayers, and doubt wasn't what they needed to get through this. They say the first year of marriage is the hardest, but they hadn't even walked down the aisle yet. It was all just a lot, and she needed to take a breath. All she could do was give it time and let John prove to her that he did, in fact, mean what he said. Sherry was dealing with a lot at work as well. The hospital had recently just reorganized its staff and positions, which led to a lot of nurses losing their jobs, 
and Sherry's list of responsibilities growing by the day. It was around this time that Sherry's car was keyed in the parking lot. It's unclear if it was Stephanie or one of the unhappy ex-employees that might have been holding a grudge after the hospital changes, or maybe it was just a random hit on a flashy car. Sherry tried not to think too much of it. She just wanted to forget what had happened and let life get back to normal. On August 2nd, Stephanie wrote in her journal, I've had headaches the last few nights. It's not work at all. It's worrying about my personal life. I really have to stop this because otherwise it's really going to kill me. She also wrote a letter to John's mother, talking about how much she cared about him and how she didn't understand what he was doing. Maybe she could talk some sense into him. This whole disaster would blow over soon enough, Stephanie kept reminding herself. It had to. By the account of just her diary alone, Stephanie seemed to be moving on. She stopped mentioning John and started bringing up different men she liked. There was Brian, a trainer at the gym, although he didn't seem to be into dating clients. She brought up a doctor named Mark, who was unfortunately already married, but that didn't stop her from flirting with him. And she started casually seeing a news cameraman named Roger. The two grabbed coffee, attended basketball games, went out for dinner. She didn't sound particularly drawn to anyone, but she didn't sound devastated either. She began moonlighting as a security officer for a college in Woodland Hills, and life just seemed to be going on as normal. The summer of 85 played out with delight for John and Sherry. Sailing trips, barbecues, dinners with friends, weekends away, just the two of them. And when they were married that November, the wedding was simple and small, but perfect. Her sisters, Teresa and Connie, were bridesmaids in bright pink dresses, all three carrying big bouquets of white wildflowers and red roses. Sherry had never felt happier. But things weren't immediately smooth sailing for the newlyweds. In December, the two went on a skiing trip, or attempted, rather. They argued the whole drive there, and when it still wasn't resolved by the time they arrived, they drove the whole way back home, with the disagreements continuing. By the time they got home, Sherry wasn't even speaking to John. She was upset about finances. She went from having a generous savings account and paying in cash to having two car payments for flashy cars that maybe there was no point in both of them trying to afford right now. Sherry felt strongly that this time in their lives should be spent saving with their future in mind, not spending themselves into debt. As Nels had predicted, the two would have to work out their different views about money, which wouldn't always be an easy process, but they knew marriage wouldn't be perfect. They'd figure it out, and they'd be just fine. John and Sherry weren't the only ones enjoying the slopes that winter. According to Sherry's parents, John's old girlfriend had once again randomly shown up, this time at the condo. Stephanie had a pair of skis in tow, asking if John could wax them. For reasons Sherry couldn't understand, John obliged, and Stephanie left the skis there. For anyone else who heard the story, it seemed like a nuisance of a situation for sure. But for Sherry, who knew about John's infidelity in the past, it was a repeated worry that John wasn't being faithful to her. She asked if things were truly over between them, and John swore that he had no idea she was stopping by. He hadn't seen or spoken to Stephanie in months and months, just like he'd promised. Years later, John will say he doesn't even recall this ever happening, and Stephanie didn't bother to make mention of it in her diary. It actually looks like around this time she was planning to put an ad in the paper in the personals. Whether a real desire or just an attempt to keep her mind off of John, she'd made a note of what she planned to submit. 25 UCLA grad, very athletic, loves to travel. Seeks tall, athletic male, 25 to 31, who likes to travel, has good sense of humor. It seemed that the issues would carry on into the new year. Sometime in the middle of January, Sherry called her parents, mentioning another crazy story about this strange other woman from John's past. Usually Sherry leaves for work before John, but one day she stayed home for a few hours, preparing the last-minute touches for a lecture she was giving at an upcoming nursing conference. Around 10 a.m., she got the shock of her life when she discovered Stephanie standing in her living room. She hadn't heard the doorbell or a knock, but even so, who the hell just walks in like that? She was in her police uniform, so maybe she was on a break at work. And she was, of course, there to see John. Sherry yelled at her to leave and never come back. Stephanie seemed to think nothing of this, but Sherry thought it was outright insane. And she obviously chose that time knowing full well she'd be at the hospital. 
Her father agreed that it would be pointless to report an LAPD officer to the LAPD. They'd probably just laugh. And she really didn't want to fuel the fire with this woman. She cried to her father, the stress of it all pushing her over the brim. It wasn't like Sherry to ever really lose her cool or even be that upset about anything. She'd become such a great nurse because of how emotionally balanced and calm she always was. Nels was fed up too. Why wasn't John doing more about this situation? It was his mess, it seemed. Once again, Stephanie didn't mention the event in her diary, but it wouldn't be so difficult to imagine her dropping by unannounced. Visiting friends during work hours was something she'd been doing for a while. Maybe she thought she could catch John alone. There were plenty of times that she enjoyed the power that came along with her badge, and in terms of doing things that mostly stayed under the radar, she did them whenever she wanted. Stephanie wasn't necessarily an amazing cop. She'd give tickets to people that other officers considered a total waste of time, especially in a place like downtown LA, jaywalking, for instance. Or if the wrong person gave her attitude, she'd run their record and try to book them for whatever she could. But she was highly esteemed. She looked great on paper, always getting nearly perfect monthly reports. She could keep up and stay out of trouble, and it worked greatly to her advantage. John and Sherry both had birthdays in the first week of February, and John wanted to take Sherry home to Tuscan. Nels thought a trip to San Diego, where they could all meet up and spend time on the boat, would be better. They could save money on airfare, and Nels could use the excuse to get away from work, too. But John insisted on taking her home. Nels was okay with it. Either way, he got to see his daughter. But he didn't really understand the insistence. They'd only been married for three months, and they'd just been home recently over the holidays. Was there something going on in the marriage? They flew in on Sherry's 29th birthday and acted like tourists the whole time. Sherry's father urged her to think about moving there. The two of them obviously loved it a lot, and it would be so great to have Sherry closer to everyone. But Sherry, being the independent soul that she was, told her father that she wanted to figure things out on her own. Ask me again in five years, she joked. The end of February would mark their three-month anniversary. She woke on the 23rd to find three red roses in a vase with a big red bow. She beamed, kissed John, and set them in the middle of the dining room table. It was a nice, slow Sunday, and they spent the day with her sister Teresa and her husband Brian. She was five months pregnant, and Sherry had gifted her a bathing suit and cap that day, a maternity gift to encourage some fun and easy exercise during her pregnancy. They visited a pet store to take a look at saltwater aquariums and then grab some lunch. Brian's car was a two-seater, so they took Sherry's silver BMW and she let him drive, him smiling like a child the whole time. Boys and their toys, Sherry and Teresa laughed. John's friend Mike stopped by that afternoon before he and Sherry caught a movie early in the evening. They always liked to do something fun on Sundays to prepare for the stressful week ahead. When they got back, Sherry talked to John while he packed his lunch for the next day. She was pretty stressed about a class she had to teach, called The People Difference, a program covering conflict resolution techniques. She'd taught it several times, so he didn't really understand why she was all that nervous. Just get it over with and you'll feel better, he reassured her. Sherry still felt anxious, but she knew he was right. She just had to get through tomorrow. The following morning was mostly like every Monday, except while John was getting ready for work, Sherry, who normally left before him, stayed in bed. She said she was thinking about calling in that day. John grabbed his things, gave her a kiss goodbye, and left, leaving the alarm unset, something they only did when someone was still inside, for fear of accidentally setting it off. While John was at work, the morning played on as normal. Retired couple and neighbors Gus and Anastasia Valenitas took their morning walk. They didn't know Sherry and John very well, mostly a hello here and there. At the beginning of their walk, around 8.30 in the morning, the garage door of Sherry's apartment was closed. When they walked back around 9.45, it was open and empty. Something that kind of stuck out, but they brushed it off as seemingly nothing. Just a scattered and busy Monday, perhaps. Shortly after that, John called home to see how Sherry was feeling, but the phone just rang and rang with no answer. Usually when they stepped out, they made sure to turn the answering machine on, but maybe she'd forgotten. She had a lot on her mind and wasn't feeling all that great. A lot of work stress. Pretty easy to forget. She must have decided to go into work after all. But when he called, her secretary said she hadn't seen her. Sherry was supposed to be teaching a class that day, so she usually just went straight there without stopping by the office first. Good, John thought. Guess everything had all worked out. Her sister Teresa also tried calling her. They were close and spoke every day. 
That morning, cleaners in Sherry's building had heard what sounded like banging and screaming, but then nothing, so it shook away all suspicion. And even stranger, the men had found Sherry's purse. They knocked on Anastasia's door, leaving it there with her after getting no response from Sherry's apartment. She would have to wait until one of their cars returned. But something seemed quite off. Chilling, really. What kind of woman goes anywhere without her purse? John mostly went about his Monday like any other Monday. He left around 7.20 like he did every morning, made a quick stop to drop off some clothes at the dry cleaners, and got to his office around 10 minutes to 8. John had started his job as an engineer at Macropolis, a company that manufactures computer hard drives, around six weeks earlier, and he was fitting in quite nicely. Sherry had said she was sick that morning, but he had a feeling that it was more nerves than an actual cold. Still, he rang her around 10 to see how she was. No answer. Guess she was feeling better. He called the hospital and spoke with Sylvia, her secretary, who said she hadn't stopped by. She'd be out teaching the class today. He almost felt a sense of pride. That a girl, Sherry. Sometimes she could get so in her head about her ability to do things, which just astounded him every time. The idea of someone like Sherry being insecure and nervous was a little hard to comprehend. She did everything so well, with such grace. When his workday was over around five, he ran a few errands, grabbed the items at the dry cleaners, and picked up a package at the UPS store on the way home. When he got there around six, he noticed the front door was open. Strange. The condo had a front door and a side door that led directly to the parking garage. John remembered Mike's visit and how he'd left through the front door. Must have been that. He must have forgot to check afterwards and lock it. But Sherry's car was gone. The garage door was open, and even stranger, broken glass sparkled on the pavement in front of the garage. Did she forget to set the alarm and also forget to close the door because she damaged her car? She'd clipped it before, backing out of the parking space. Looks like she'd had quite the morning. But when he walked inside, he immediately knew something was wrong. Off. It was only seconds later that he saw Sherry lying on the middle of the living room floor. As John dropped everything in his arms and ran over to her, he simultaneously noticed that the room was strewn about. Sherry was still in the clothes she was wearing when he'd left that morning. A short, rust-colored robe over a sleeveless shirt and underwear. Her face was bruised, her left eye open and unblinking. Her right eye was swollen shut and crusted with blood. Her lips were parted slightly. There was blood smeared on her forehead. John reached out to feel her, and a jolt went through his body when he felt her leg, cold and stiff. She didn't have a pulse. He called 911, crying and confused. He draped a hand towel over her face while he waited for the paramedics to arrive. He didn't know what to do with himself. He felt so small. Their place was a strange disaster. The shelf on their entertainment unit was collapsed. Their corded telephone outstretched across the floor, their VCR equipment in a stack by the door, and a drawer of an end table had been pulled out and its contents dumped. Paramedics got there at 6.08 and officially pronounced Sherry dead at 6.10. John had been so disturbed and shocked that it seems he hadn't noticed the three gunshot wounds to her chest or the deep bite mark on the inside of her left arm. This wasn't just a medical house call. This was a crime scene. By 6.20, the first LAPD officers of the Van Nuys Division would arrive before more seasoned detectives would make their way to the site. Given the area and the initial assessment, it seemed pretty clear that Sherry had been the unfortunate victim of a burglary gone wrong. Of course, they would need to treat this like any other case and go through the regular process. One of the first things on their list would be to interview John, assuring him that it was just to get rid of him as any sort of suspect. We always have to start at who's closest to the victim and work our way out, they explained. A broken John left with them for the police station around 9 p.m. Detective Lyle Mayer was a fast learner and even faster when it came to talking. He'd worked his way up to detective in the force, dealing mainly with homicide cases. He could match that level of intensity. He was aware that his investigations included the highest level of getting things right. His work could mean the difference between life and death when it came to innocence or guilt. He took that seriously. Every detective tends to have their own unique skills or strengths. 
Some might be better trainers or interviewers. Some might write up a better report than the next guy. Some might think outside the box a little more often. But Mayer considered himself to be someone with a vast skill set who could pretty much do it all. The Rasmussen case didn't stump him much. A burglary in broad daylight is gutsy, sure, but it happens more than people think. An unfortunate circumstance for the woman who was home. The husband came across believable. Poor guy. Most likely an open-shut case. John explained that there hadn't been a gun in the house, so the person or persons must have been armed. No one else really had access to the home. He mentioned who'd been in the house on Sunday, and also Evangeline Flores, their housekeeper. A car would be out to pick her up and bring her back to the station to be interviewed. They did a bolo, or be on the lookout, for Sherry's car. The vehicle was a bit flashy, but not in a way that it stood out in the neighborhood or anything. It was a nice neighborhood like that. There were better cars that would have been easier to steal. Sherry would have had her checkbook and credit card, a few gas cards in her purse, maybe a few small bills. It wasn't like either of them to carry big amounts of cash. As for John, well, he had no reason to harm his wife. He was pretty sure she didn't have any sort of life insurance policy. They didn't share any assets or children together. They'd only been married for three months, and so far it had been bliss. They were crazy about each other. You could ask anyone. The pair had also installed a panic button in the house. There was one by her bed and one downstairs. When they'd made the purchase, they had a conversation about what they would do, and both agreed they'd definitely press the button first before going to play hero and inspect what might be a robbery in the making. Sherry must have been caught off guard, and given the initial impression, it seems there'd been a fight. All the images kept flashing in John's mind with every question, and it made him sick to his stomach. Some of the questions were things about Sherry he didn't know for sure, which only cut him deeper by the minute reminding him of all the future and memories and moments with her that were now lost forever. They'd have to do a more thorough walkthrough of the apartment with him tomorrow, ask him a few more questions. But with that, the interview was done for now, and John was instructed to get a hotel room for the night. He waited at the station for his parents, who were making the drive from San Diego to meet him. It had been hours since he discovered Sherry's body, but he still hadn't notified her family. He just couldn't bring himself to do it. John's father would be the one to call Nels in the late hours of the night, telling him that his daughter was dead. Nels was, of course, shocked. It was unbelievable. And why had nobody called sooner if this had happened at six o'clock? He was angry because it was too late to book a flight. Him and Loretta would be forced to wait until morning, their heads spinning with confusion about what happened to Sherry. They stayed up all night notifying family members and letting them know they'd be flying into California. Nell's mind raced. They didn't really know the circumstances yet, but they'd been contacted by a homicide detective. Did someone hurt her on purpose? Nell's knew she'd been dealing with a lot of stress at the hospital, and there'd been a nurse who didn't get some sort of promotion who'd been upset. Sherry's car had been keyed, and there was John's ex-girlfriend. Sherry had received some nasty phone calls and strange visits from that woman feeling like she was being followed at times, but Nels couldn't recall her name. But it sounded like she'd been home during some sort of break-in, wrong place, wrong time thing from what the police were saying. And when they arrived at the station, the commanding officer had already told the LA Times newspaper that Sherry had been killed during a burglary gone wrong. We're going to do everything we can to find whoever did this to your daughter, detectives assured Nels. And they would. But it would take more time than anyone ever expected. The lead investigators felt that John's demeanor was sincere right off the bat. He was clearly distressed, in shock, and heartbroken. As they assessed the scene, they noticed that the front door had been unlocked, which is possibly how the suspect or suspects had entered without force. Was Sherry nice enough to have let someone in? Also possible. The disarray of the home painted a picture of surprise and a fight. There were fingernails on the entryway tile, blood on the floor, smeared on lamps and light bulbs. There was a rope stained with blood, possibly to tie Sherry up, but she had obviously put up the fight of her life. Five latent fingerprints were found, but only one was identifiable. The others were too partial or smeared. There was a bloody fingerprint on top of the VCR and Sony CD player stacked by the door, which was not taken into evidence. Sherry must have heard something come downstairs and interrupted them. If Sherry tried to run, or maybe go for the gun, then a fight definitely would have ensued. 
There was a panic button downstairs. She could have possibly been trying to make her way to that. From the looks of the place, it seems Sherry was probably winning the fight for a while. It had been extensive. Detectives would first note her purse missing as well as the vehicle. The suspects had obviously been so freaked out they'd left whatever they'd came for in the first place. The rest of the apartment was undisturbed. When they did a sexual assault kit on Sherry, that's when they discovered the bite mark on the inside of her forearm. There wasn't anything as precise as DNA testing at the time, but they would have been able to see the blood type, certain proteins and enzymes present, the teeth impressions, etc. The tube swabs from the bite mark were sealed into an envelope and frozen. The chronological log, or chrono for short, is basically a file responsible for tracking every single movement of a case. People that were interviewed, evidence that was gathered, contact attempts, day-to-day investigative work, basically every detail of a case that comes your way. There was an issue with the chrono of the Rasmussen case almost from the get-go. Full pages of it were even missing. And the issue with chronos is that often any detective can have access to them. So tracing can be challenging, especially on a high-activity case like homicide. The Van Nuys division of the LAPD would be assigned the case, a division that Stephanie started working in shortly after Sherry's murder. And yet any connection between her and John would seemingly go unnoticed. It could have been the fact that John's name was often misspelled, which would have made it harder to contact someone in the days where you rely on phone books and friends for information. There were notes made of threatening calls received at work, possibly some rivalry or an unhappy ex-employee at the hospital. No mention of Stephanie, though, or any ex-girlfriend of John's. John didn't bring up Stephanie until the walkthrough at the apartment. His mother was present for it, lending her support, but it might have been uncomfortable to talk in depth about his infidelity and the true nature of Stephanie's involvement and his relationship with Sherry. Nobody really knew the history between Stephanie and John. Even some of John's closest friends from UCLA that he'd kept in touch with all this time had no idea that their friendship had blurred into the lines of anything sexual. Even Sherry never would have known if it wasn't for Stephanie showing up at her work. His mother may not have been aware of the infidelity, but she was aware of Stephanie and her feelings for John. Stephanie had confessed many feelings to her over the years in her letters and conversations, and yet it seems she didn't press the issue of any possible involvement. Nobody would know what really happened that morning. Monday had been Stephanie's fourth day off in a row. Not an impulsive choice, just regular routine. Mayor had been right. There were no signs of forced entry, and John hadn't set the alarm. Sherry wouldn't have heard Stephanie slowly coming into the condo and closing the door behind her. The two bullets that were fired into the home and shattered a sliding glass door were all the more proof that she hadn't come there to talk. Talking wasn't fixing anything, and Stephanie couldn't take it anymore. The relentless thoughts tossing and turning every night, the burning jealousy. Stephanie and Sherry fought like animals, Sherry managing momentarily to place Stephanie in a kind of headlock, wrestling the gun away briefly. At one point, possibly to get out of that, she bit Sherry's arm. And using a heavy ceramic vase in the living room, she crashed it over Sherry's head, leaving her dazed and struggling to stay conscious. And then Stephanie shot Sherry in her chest. She would have only had minutes to live, She grabbed a nearby blanket off of a chair to muffle the sound and fired two more rounds, finishing the job. She grabbed Sherry's purse and left, closing the door behind her. She rummaged through it, taking only the car keys and their marriage certificate from her wallet. Sherry had been planning to open a separate joint savings account, and she was carrying it around in case she needed proof that she was transitioning from her maiden name to Rutten. Stephanie shoved it in her pocket and tossed the purse to the garage floor. She got in the car with a plan to drop it somewhere random. She hadn't driven to John's place for a reason, and she wanted to get out of there ASAP. She'd set things up to look like a robbery. Once, when she was house-sitting for a family, she'd been the victim of a house robbery. They'd tied her up and everything. This stuff just happened. Sad, really. And she knew John would be heartbroken, but she didn't care. She'd been heartbroken for years because of him, she thought. He brought this on himself. As Stephanie drove off... She felt calm and jittery at the same time. Her mind buzzed with all she'd learned since she'd come onto the force. She'd planned to do a lot of things in her career as a cop. She did it so well and with such ease, it'd be hard to believe that getting away with murder hadn't been one of them. The day after Sherry's murder, Stephanie reported to work at 730 partnered up with another officer and kept a log while he drove, and Stephanie's journal that day was unremarkable. 
Mike drove. For the workout today, we played basketball at Northridge Park. We didn't do much. In fact, I can't even remember what we did. But the day was boring and nothing happened that was worth remembering. Except that I'm going to morning watch for sure soon. Stephanie didn't mention John anymore. She didn't mention Sherry's murder. Strangely enough, for an LAPD officer working in the same division as the one on the case, she seemed to appear oblivious and suddenly aloof. On the afternoon of March 9th, Stephanie walked into the Santa Monica Police Department. She identified herself as an LAPD officer and wanted to report a crime. Her gun was missing, and she suspected it had been stolen from her car. She'd been working out on the beach, and when she got back, the driver's side door had been damaged. She'd had her gun in her gym bag, which was gone, along with some money and music cassettes from the glove box. It's not noted if anyone bothered to actually check Stephanie's vehicle. And Stephanie would have been aware that the automated firearm system, where this information would be logged, wasn't made to notify anybody when an officer's firearm is reported missing or stolen. Unless an officer reports it to their own department or someone goes searching into the database, there's no way for anyone to know. Even though Santa Monica is within L.A. County, it had its own city government and police that operated independently. Stephanie never reported the missing gun to the LAPD, so they would have had no way of knowing, and she didn't make mention of anything about it in her journal. The most important thing that happened to her that day, on paper anyway, was a tanning appointment at 5.30. In the early afternoon of April 10th, a woman came home in the middle of a burglary, just a quarter of a mile from Sherry's condo. The woman shouted at the men to get out, but quickly ran away after one of them pulled out a revolver. She called the police from a neighbor's house and gave a description for composites to be made up of two male men, described as Mexican. They both left in a blue Ford station wagon, and no attempt to steal her car was made. They'd just taken some jewelry. If prints were taken from the crime, there was nothing on file about comparisons with ones that were taken from Sherry's home. Nonetheless, this only fueled the theory of a burglary gone wrong. A $10,000 reward with Cherry's photograph and the composite sketches would be released, but nothing seemed to come of it. If there were any tips given at all, they weren't logged in the chrono. Over the years, the Rasmussen family would continue to check in for any status updates on the case, which there never were. John left his job. Eventually, he couldn't afford to keep the condo, nor did he really want to. Every inch of the place was plastered with beautiful and horrible memories of Sherry. He moved in with his parents for nine months before finding enough strength to get back on his feet again. He would eventually remarry. It seemed that John didn't have any leftover curiosity or concern about what happened to Sherry because, unlike the Rasmussen family, John never contacted the police for updates about the case, never pressured them to find out who did it. But Sherry's family would continue to fight for justice, convinced that there was something the police weren't seeing. They sent information to America's Most Wanted, a television show that portrayed dangerous fugitives through reenactments, interviews, and narration by the host. Unfortunately, they didn't respond. In 1988, her sister Connie reached out to Anne Rule, a crime writer often known best for her personal connection to Ted Bundy. Rule even met with the family and asked them questions they hadn't even thought to ask themselves. But when Rule spoke to a trusted retired LAPD investigator about it, he told her it was too hot to touch. With nobody to do the proper groundwork for her in L.A., and being unable to travel there for any meaningful amount of time and do it herself, Rule eventually declined. But it hadn't been all for nothing. The conversation had sparked some curiosity in them, and they wrote a letter to the police chief, Daryl Gates, bringing up their need for more details. Was John's ex-girlfriend checked out? Had they interviewed the disgruntled nurse? Were the dental impressions checked against everyone else's dental work? If there was no forced entry, had any other suspects, say friends or acquaintances, been looked into? Were their phone records checked? If it was a burglary, why was the marriage license technically the only thing that had been taken? And finally, if they wanted her vehicle so badly, why was her car found with its keys inside only several miles from her home? The family never received a response. There is no note in the chrono about the letter, and it's unclear if Gates ever received and read it. When Nels finally got his hands on the autopsy report, he noticed two things right away. First, if his daughter had a bite mark, he was well aware of how strong a piece of evidence that was. He wasn't a forensic dentist by any means, but he knew people had been discovered and convicted on that. And second, the type of ammunition used matched the type of guns that the LAPD officers use. Why wasn't anybody looking into this stuff? 
Why were the fingerprints found only compared to Sherry, John, and his friend Mike? Sometime around 1993, they pushed to meet with the head detective on the case, although instead of Mayer, they got another detective. Nels asked if they could run the fingerprints through the FBI's database. He assured them that they were working on the case. When he mentioned that they couldn't afford to run the DNA testing, Nels offered to pay for it himself. Great gesture and all, the detective explained. But unless they had a suspect to compare the DNA to, it was just as useless as it was sitting around. The tension between the fed-up family and the police was a strain for everyone involved. Years later, Detective Mayer will understandably resent the accusations of lying for one of their own. An officer, he noted, he didn't have any kind of relationship with. He would be insulted at the idea that he ignored leads or valuable evidence. And he would say that Nels was trying to deflect his own guilt for teaching his daughter to be the kind of woman that fights for a gun instead of runs away. And as for Stephanie, life went on quite nicely, it seems. If taking the life of another person had any weight on her, you never would have known it from the outside. Stephanie was a master at internal affairs. It wasn't valor that carried her through so much as the business and social sides of being a cop that she really excelled at. She continued to climb the ladder in the LAPD. She would spend a successful four years in the Drug Abuse Resistance Education Program, or DARE, for short. It was a joint initiative between Chief Gates and the LA School District as a means to prevent the use of controlled substances, gang activity, and other violent behavior. The gig involved travel, and while in Oregon, this is how she would eventually meet her husband, Scott, in 1992. By the following year, he had moved in with Stephanie and became an officer with the LAPD himself. They adopted a little girl together, which inspired Stephanie to raise money for a daycare program for other parent officers. It wasn't all perfect for her. She lost her home because of an earthquake in 94. She battled and survived thyroid cancer, which required her to take a synthetic hormone on an empty stomach each morning for the rest of her life. But whether bad days or good days, there were no days for Sherry. Months turned into years, and years turned into decades. And just as Stephanie had finally stopped looking over her shoulder, her past would creep up on her when she least expected it. Even though DNA testing became much more prominent by the late 90s, it wouldn't be until 2004 when the evidence in the Rasmussen case was finally analyzed, and the issue would shed light on another dark corner of the LAPD's shaky reputation at the time. The sample was found shoved in the back of a freezer in a ripped envelope, a hole that appeared to be made from the tube itself contained inside. Criminalist Jennifer Francis hadn't just been responsible for testing it, she was given access to the entire case file. When it appeared that the bite mark from the perpetrator pointed to a female suspect, the burglary theory seemed completely debunked. When she looked back and saw mention of a woman from John's past who had harassed Sherry at her job and home, she approached the detective supervising her. Jennifer's angle was brushed off. The LAPD officer had nothing to do with this. One of the burglars could have been female. Nothing worth looking at. The results would go back into the case file, and it would be another four years until the mysterious details of the Rasmussen case would bubble to the surface again. In 2001, Police Chief Bernard Parks created the Cold Case Homicide Unit. Its purpose was to begin tackling the backlog of unsolved cases that had evidence which could possibly be tested, given new technology, or maybe just might require a fresh pair of eyes. Detectives Jim Nuttall and Pete Barba would discover that, indeed, the Rasmussen case did have DNA to test. What's even more interesting is that the DNA was female. Woman-on-woman homicide is rare, and even more rare when you add in burglary on top of it. Maybe the burglary angle had been wrong all along. The more digging they did, the more it seemed that Sherry wasn't the type of person who would have put herself in harm's way to wrestle a gun from a couple of robbers and play hero. But DNA, unfortunately, is only as good as what it's tested against. If there are no matches in the combined DNA index system, also known as CODIS, then all you've got is evidence, with no suspect to match it to. Detective Nuttall would start from the very beginning, throwing out all prior theories. He spoke to everyone he could track down listed in the chrono, and plenty of people who also weren't listed. People who had never been interviewed, like Sherry's closest friends and her secretary. Once he got to John, he asked him about a note he'd read in the case file. Something about an ex-girlfriend, Stephanie P.O.? Turns out, P.O. meant police officer something most people who'd read the note probably didn't realize. An LAPD police officer at that. Stephanie Lazarus. By that time, she'd joined the art theft division. It was cushy compared to her earlier years on the force. 
She no longer dealt with squad car drives or taking statements from victims all day long. She spent most of her days at her desk, no more random work hours or overnight shifts. She dealt with a lot of museums and galleries day in and day out, giving statements and interviews for the media, that kind of thing. This news was explosive. Investigating another officer for homicide on a case that's been sitting cold for years? Just another item on a long list of scandals for the LAPD. Not only that, but they had to be careful not to tip anyone off, especially Stephanie. They created a generic tracking number for the case instead of attaching it to the original case file because anybody could access that, including her. Maybe she had been for years, checking up to see if anything new had happened, possibly editing things to her liking. Nobody could really be sure. The detectives would start tracking her every move, right from her 5 a.m. wake-up, where she'd get ready and drive herself to the train station. Officers would watch her read the paper on the train, throw it out in the same garbage every day on her way into the office, and then sit at her desk, eating a muffin or a yogurt. They attempted to collect wrappers here and there, but nothing ever contained enough DNA to test. It wasn't until one of her days off that they finally got the opportunity they'd been waiting for. Stephanie went to Costco with her daughter, and after the two finished their pizza and sodas, officers would retrieve the cups, straws, and plates from the trash. They would test the DNA against the evidence found at the scene of Sherry's murder. It was a match. The morning of June 5, 2009, had finally arrived. Everyone, all the way up to the chief, had been involved in the planning of this day. While Stephanie was making her way to work on the train as usual, plainclothes officers who had been briefed on a search warrant before dawn that morning were making their way inside her home to seize her computers and diaries. Another team would also search her car at the train station parking lot. The best time would be to talk to her while she was at work, but they didn't really know what to expect of Stephanie. She'd be armed, like every other officer on duty, and they didn't want to risk some violent outburst. Detectives Daniel Jaramillo and Greg Stearns from the Robbery Homicide Division would carry out the interrogation, disguised as a situation dealing with a case involving art theft where they could really use her expertise. They might need her to question a suspect. Usual protocol requires officers to remove their weapons before entering an interrogation room. Stephanie's stomach growled, but she skipped her usual yogurt. How long could this take anyway? The interrogation, which would later be released online, would go down in crime history, a fly-on-the-wall perspective of a gotcha moment in the process, a lying police officer, a wait over two decades long. Stephanie walks into the room and Daniel introduces her to his partner. She takes a seat, and just as he starts to explain what's about to happen, she asks if she should record the meeting. You're going to bring someone in, right? Yeah, well, I didn't want to talk about anything in an area where people were listening, but... We've been assigned a case, and in reviewing that case, we've seen some notes that mention your name. Do you know John Rutten? John Rutten? John Rutten? Oh yeah, I went to school with them. And when asked how long they knew each other, Stephanie explains that they met at UCLA in 78 and confirms that they were very close friends. Why? What's all this about? The detective goes on to explain again that they've come across a case involving John and some people have brought her name up. He asked about their relationship, and Stephanie explains, Yeah, we dated, you know. I mean, again, what's all this about? He tells her that it's related to a case having to do with his wife. Did you happen to know her, who she was, or anything like that? Not really, Stephanie says. Let me think. God, it's been a long time ago. Stephanie sits back in her chair, concentrating with a frown at the floor, as if trying very hard to reach some fuzzy memory in the distance. And again, he brings it back to her relationship with John. Uh, well, let me see. Let me ask you. You said you, you dated John. How long did you guys date? I mean, well, are you guys? Is this something? I mean, you said hey, well, I was going to interview somebody about art and how well, you guys are. Here's, here's <laughs> I mean, Stephanie. Here's the situation. Is basically, we, you know, we knew that this when we saw this in the in in this chrono that maybe you know there was some relationship there. That's what the chrono seemed to indicate, and we didn't want to come up to you at your desk and ask those kinds of questions or do anything. You know how up there people can see what's going on if you go into an interview room or people are in there getting oh, supplies. Okay. So we, we wanted to afford you some privacy, some confidentiality okay. to talk about this because we thought it might be, you know, something, you know, you're married to someone else, obviously, and so forth, and that you may not want to, you know, talk about these things in that setting where someone, you know, we don't want the rumor mill or gossip or any of that kind of stuff yeah, to I mean, start. that's fine. I mean... So we, we, we did this just as, as a means to try and speak to you okay, in just a confidential I mean, just, place where you, you know, where where your business isn't out there for other people in, in well, you know, I mean, your division yeah, and all I mean, about. You know, God, that's been a million years ago. I mean, The detectives were aware that this dance would take patience. 
They weren't sure how much Stephanie would be willing to say and successfully continued to cater to her frustrations with a cop-to-cop sort of reasoning, chalking the need to talk about this so seriously in a private interrogation room because this was the last thing they needed circulating water cooler conversation. And the detective again goes in for more details about John, trying to see just how long she'll play it cool about a man she allegedly obsessed over for years. Stephanie's answers at times are nonsensical rambles, a red bouncing ball following the words that manages to constantly go off the rails even with the simplest, most straightforward question. When she's asked how long her and John dated, her response is over a minute long and she still doesn't quite answer anyway. Well, let me ask you, <laughs> roughly how long would you, would you say you guys dated? Jeez, um, I couldn't even say. I mean, I started school there in 78. Mm-hmm. I started UCLA in 1978. Mm-hmm. I graduated in 82. Um, I don't even remember what year he graduated, if it was a year or two before me. Okay. Um, I think he was a little bit older than I was. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, I can't remember if he was born, let's say I was born in 60, 1960. I don't know if he was born in 58 or 59. I mean, I, you know... Um, I mean, I knew his parents, I knew his sister, his brother went to Northridge, mm-hmm. um, um, you know, his sister spent the night at my house before, obviously I spent the night at his house before, he probably spent the night at my house before, um, you know, I, I yeah. you know, I don't, I, Well, correct me if I'm wrong, because from what you're telling me, is you, you guys dated while you were in college together, right? Yeah, and probably after college, um, I'm, I, I can't. She continues to ramble on about the college dorms, trying to figure out when exactly she met her husband, before finding herself at the end of a nonsensical answer, and once again asking what all this is about. She tends to be contradictory, explaining that they were extremely close friends, but also making John sound like a speck of sand on a beach, nothing particularly special or unique about him, or their relationship as far as she could recall. They remain friendly, kept in touch after college, even took some trips together, noting one to Hawaii in 88. Maybe they also spoke a few times since she got married, she couldn't really recall. And as for the wife, who knows? I think she was a nurse. I couldn't even tell you how he met her. It's been so long ago, Stephanie told them. I mean, I didn't go to their wedding. I couldn't even tell you when they got married. It's been a million years ago, she kept reminding them. And as they continued to ask her if she ever knew his wife, met her, or spoke to her, Stephanie is extremely expressive her eyebrows and mouth contorting over and over into more and more utter confusion. But the detective slowly began to hone in on the matter at hand. You know, I don't understand why you're talking about some guy I dated a million years ago. Well, do you know what happened to his wife? Yeah, I know she got killed. What Um, did you you hear about that? I I saw a poster at work. Um, I'm sure I spoke to him about it. Um, I think I spoke to another friend of his about it. Um... And how did, how did you first learn about that? Jeez. <laughs> Someone could have called me. I could have heard it at work. Um, I think at one point there may have been a flyer or something. I know a good friend of his... Um, Were you on the job back then when that happened? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I'm sure I was on the job. That's why I would have heard about it with a flyer. Um, he had a good friend. With some coaxing and suggestions, Stephanie recalls that, yes, John's wife must have worked at a hospital. Maybe she even met her there. They might have spoken a few times. Detective Stearns continues to maintain a gentle tone of harmless curiosity. Being that you used to see John, was everything okay with you guys? Was anything uncomfortable between you and her? But Stephanie again goes on to state how long it's been, that she barely remembers if they even had a conversation, let alone if things ever got uncomfortable. She mistakenly lets a possible detail slip as she starts. I may have seen her at his apart, uh, I don't know, geez. Stephanie throws her hands up in the air with confusion. Oh, where was his apartment? And Stephanie tells him, without missing a beat, but says she never visited him or his wife there, nothing like that. She hung out with his sister, she'd gone to his little brother's basketball games. This brought her onto the subject of how she recently paid for a service to have all of her physical photographs scanned onto CDs, something upward of 10,000 photos. Pictures of John, his brother at his games, visits with his parents, etc. The digital encyclopedia of memories was surely being collected by the LAPD right at that moment as she sat across the table describing its contents. The detectives ask again once more if she remembers going over to his place any time after he was married, the new place he'd moved into with his wife. I honestly don't know. I don't think so. 
I don't want to say, oh, no, I don't think so. And then he says, oh, yeah, she came over for something, dropped something off, you know? I don't know. At around 30 minutes into the conversation, she's giving the detectives even more details with a little bit of prompting here and there. They managed to get her from never having met John's wife to explaining that they most likely had a conversation regarding John. Shelly or Sherry. Now that she's thinking about it, yeah, in a hospital in L.A., maybe they had met for sure after all. At one point, I mean, he may have been dating her, or I don't know, maybe he was married, I don't even remember. And I'm like, you know what, why are you calling me if you're either dating her or living with her or married to her? Because I, I, I honestly don't remember the time frame. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm like, come on, knock it off. And I'm and now I'm thinking, I may, I may have gone to her and say, hey, you know what, you know what, is he dating you, He's he's bothering me. Um, and so I'm thinking that we had a conversation about that, um, one or two, maybe, I, I, you know, I, it could have been three. I don't want to say I had three conversations with her. Oh. Like, I, at, I like at her work or at their, at their house or? No, I'm thinking that I, you know, he obviously must have told me where she worked. I'm thinking it was a hospital somewhere in L.A. And I just, I mean, I could have been, again, what year was that? Where was I working? The detectives continue to patiently listen, pretending to barely know a thing about the case, just curious to get the rundown from her first. They take another angle and suggest that maybe his wife was the problem. Maybe a well-meaning Stephanie had shown up and things had gone awry because of Sherry, but Stephanie didn't really bite. I mean, would you remember if she snapped on you and just like, hey man, it's my man, you know, you get him, leave him alone, you know, blah, 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 that kind of stuff? You know... And would you remember an incident like that? I mean, because that would be like, what? Well, you know, and maybe that happened. I mean, uh, gosh, I, you know, it's been so long ago. I, you know, I just, I mean, that's not ringing a bell. Mm-hmm. Um, because the times I've seen you around. And, around. and Stephanie again starts to get a little frustrated and manic, explaining that it's been so long she doesn't remember, doesn't know anything about anything. Had this discussion with her? I mean, that's sounding familiar. I mean, that's now that you guys are bringing this stuff up. Um, I mean, it sound that sounds familiar. Um, but again, I mean, you know, what's I mean, what's this got to do with me dating him and you know her getting killed? I mean, I I don't you know I don't have anything to do with it. And you got something that's somebody said you know whatever. I mean, Stearns again explains how they saw her name in the file and figured, hey, she's next door to us in the same department. Let's just go get some background information from her about it. Again, caters to the idea of respect, not wanting to talk about such personal things on the job in front of just anyone. She calms down and tells them she appreciates their discretion. They ask about her working in the Van Nuys division who investigated Sherry's murder. Had she talked to anyone regarding the case? Who knows, maybe Stephanie had seen a flyer or something, called to explain she knew John and offer whatever help she could. Maybe she'd even spoken to a detective about it on record. Maybe not. She couldn't really recall. The same also applied for any other times, like her showing up at the apartment unannounced looking for John. Stephanie remains wildly expressive, wide-eyed, and surprised, doing her best to appear bewildered and totally caught off guard. An incident where you showed up, you weren't supposed to show up, and things got heated. At his house? Yeah. <laughs> that I, you know, I, that just doesn't sound familiar. I Nothing. mean, uh, I, you know, it's not sounding familiar. So not at all. Now you're saying not familiar because it's just something well, you remember, or it's well, just you know what? I would have then I'd have to say I don't remember because I don't remember. I it, that doesn't sound familiar. I. I mean, would you, you remember know, something like that in your life? If, well, I would think, Some but... sort of drama involving, you know, the other woman type of thing. Well, sure. Did you ever fight with her? You mean like we fought? Yeah. Did you ever yeah. duke it out with her? No, I don't think so. I mean... You'd remember that, right? That would be pretty... Yeah, I would think so. I pretty mean... Pretty specific. Th- you know, yeah, like I said, I mean, dramatic. obviously... Yeah, I, you know, I mean, it just doesn't sound familiar. It was nearing an hour of back and forth, and the detective started pushing even more about Sherry, about those conversations at the hospital and her apartment. Sherry's friends and family had a lot more than Stephanie to say about it. But Stephanie continued to act as if this didn't make any sense to her. There was no confrontation or hard feelings. There was no drama. I mean, I mean, what are they saying? So I, I, I fought with her, so, so now I'm mean, I, 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 I get, getting the jump, the leap. Excuse me, I haven't eaten... Um, 
they're saying, okay, I fought with her, so I must have killed her. I mean, come on. I mean, that's, you know, I, I don't even know who these people are. I, I can't even say I met any of these people. I mean, that's, it's insane. I, if it happened, I honestly don't remember it. The detective finally tries to reason with this notion that Stephanie wouldn't remember the details of such a run-in. A love triangle situation, a heated conversation at a hospital, an altercation at John's apartment. Had her life been so full of intense events that she couldn't recall how this specific one had played out? Well, I would think, Stephanie strangely agreed. After they cross the one-hour mark, the detectives decide that it's time to slowly start revealing the cards they have hidden up their sleeves. It would be no secret to someone like Stephanie that over the years, the way cases were investigated had changed a lot, mainly with more technological advances. The scene had been processed in 1986, during a time when DNA testing wasn't even available. Stephanie interjects. You're right. I mean, if you guys are claiming that I'm a suspect, then, you know, I, I got a problem with, you know, with that. Okay. Okay? So, you know, if you're, if you're doing this as an interrogation, you're saying, hey, I'm a suspect. Well, I, now I got a problem with, you know, now you're accusing me of this? Is that what you're, is that what you're saying? We're trying to figure out what happened, Stephanie. Uh, well, I'm, I was, you know, I'm just saying, the, you know, do I need to get a lawyer if you're accusing me of I this? I mean, you know. You don't have to, I mean, you know, I'm just, you're here of your own free will. I mean, no, you, you well, I know, but I mean. I mean you know you're, not, you're not under arrest. You can walk out You can leave you whenever you like. Well, but, you know, it, I, I'm trying <clears> to give you some background of, you know, how I knew him. And now you're telling me that some somebody's saying that we had this big old fight and I don't even know what you're talking about. Um, you know, and I don't want to, you know, get in trouble for something that I didn't even do, or you're saying I did something. Okay, yeah, we understand. The detectives did the best they could back then with a crime scene, he continues. But there are other things that can be looked at now. And then he asks Stephanie what is most likely the scariest question of the entire hour. The DNA stuff and things of the nature that, you know, gets done on cases nowadays. You know, if we asked you for a, a DNA swab, would you be willing to give us one? Maybe. <laughs> Because now, 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 because now, now I'm thinking I probably need to talk to a lawyer. Okay. I mean, well, I because I know how this stuff works. Okay, don't get me wrong. You're right. I have been doing this a long time. Yeah. And and I wish I had been recording this because because now it sounds like you know there's you know you're selling these people say I'm a fighting with her and now <sighs> it sounds like you're trying to you know I've been doing this a long time. Yeah. We know. Okay. And, it, and now it almost sounds like you're trying to pin something on me. No, now no. I, I got that sense. Well, what it gets to, I mean. Stephanie begins to shut down as the intent of the conversation has come fully to light. She tells them that she knows they have to do their job, but it's insane. She can't even believe this. I guess I'm going to have to contact somebody. I mean, I know how this stuff works. And with that, it's over. Stephanie gets up and thanks them for the courtesy of the private meeting, says she really wishes she'd been recording it after all, and walks out of the room not realizing that the jig was already up. There would be no time left anymore for her. Within just a moment, Stephanie returns back into the frame of the video camera, hands cuffed behind her back. This is absolutely crazy. Let me see it, Stephanie. This is insane. Okay. Stephanie, you know you have the right to remain silent. Do you understand? Yes. Anything you say may be used against you in court. Do you understand? Yes. You have the right to the presence of an attorney before and during any questioning. Do you understand? Yes. If you cannot afford an attorney, one will be appointed for you free of charge before any questioning if you want. Do you understand? Yes. Do you want to talk to us right now? No. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. This then. is crazy. Okay. This is absolutely... I'm like, I'm like in shock. I'm totally in shock. Stephanie was arrested and charged with the murder of Sherry Rasmussen and brought to the Los Angeles County Jail. Her booking photo shows her smiling, piercing eyes attempting to hide a forced ease, an empty joy, still playing a part to the very end. Predictably, the media was a frenzy at the news of the LAPD arresting one of their own. The trial would only last two weeks, with over 50 people taking the stand to testify. Deputy District Attorney Shannon Presby and Paul Nunes would spend nearly three years preparing a clear-cut and evidence-backed story of lust, rejection, obsession, and revenge for the court. Eyewitness accounts, 
DNA evidence, a riveting interrogation, connections to the weapon. When it came to the burden of proof, the burden felt as light as a feather. A bite, a bullet, a gun barrel, and a broken heart. That's the evidence that will prove to you the defendant, Stephanie Lazarus, murdered Sherry Rasmussen, Presby would tell the jury of eight women and four men in his opening statement. But defense attorney Mark Overland would argue that the case was botched from the beginning. The evidence collected had a questionable chain of custody. The discovery of the ripped envelope itself should immediately discount the DNA as flawed. There was other DNA that didn't match anyone, that hadn't been looked at as a viable suspect. And more importantly, Stephanie wasn't obsessed with John. Infatuated, sure. But when she showed up at the hospital that day, it wasn't to confront Sherry. It was to plead with her to get John to leave her alone and stop pursuing her since he was engaged now. He was the one pursuing Stephanie, not the other way around. When Stephanie returned to work after those days off in February, there was nobody who seemed to notice any changes in her demeanor. If she had any injuries, nothing would have stood out, and she could have easily explained those away given her line of work. Her old friend and roommate Mike would testify about his experiences of living with her during those days of John courting Sherry and being engaged to get married. Stephanie was clearly head over heels. She told Mike that she was in love with John and mentioned him frequently when they lived together. She told him about the day at the hospital, telling Mike about how Sherry wasn't even good looking. Stephanie wasn't really the type to lose her cool, but after that whole situation, she became a lot more sad and passive-aggressive. The jury would be captivated, as John would also take the stand. He described their on-and-off-again friends-with-benefits relationship through college, and when asked said he probably slept with Stephanie somewhere around 25 to 30 times total. When he reached a point of describing when and how he met Sherry, he started crying. And when it came to the strange love triangle with Stephanie, he truly felt it was a separate issue from what he believed to be a burglary gone wrong all those years ago. He'd mentioned Stephanie and was told she wasn't involved. He trusted the detectives knew what they were doing. And most people just don't want to believe it, don't have the capacity to imagine someone they've known for years, shared a bed with, could kill their wife, could kill anyone. John had continued his friendship with Stephanie after what happened to Sherry, recalling their trip to Hawaii, saying he told Stephanie that when the police asked for names, he'd given them hers. She was upset, but nothing major. I mean, nothing had come of it. They didn't sleep together then, but they did at least two instances sometime after returning from Hawaii. Stephanie never brought Sherry up to him, not in a curious way, but also not even in a way you'd expect a friend of such an intimate nature to act. She never really asked him how he was, and she never offered her help or expertise as a police officer either. And as their lives moved on and things took space between them, they grew further apart. And he would, instead, often blame himself, even if it didn't make sense. There was no genius to Stephanie's crime, but rather mistakes and oversights that played out in her favor. A 2012 article in Vanity Fair would describe Stephanie as legendary, but in reality, she was just at the right place at the right time. She followed the rules and paid her dues. She knew what to do in order to climb the ladder. She had no shame in shortcuts. She didn't always follow policy. She wasted time on petty crimes just to give out tickets. She judged and blamed victims. She managed to hold her own among men on the force, physically especially, and that was a feat that played very well in her favor, besides being fairly sociable. And in his closing arguments, D.A. Shannon Presby told the jury, You've heard she was a police officer. She was well-liked by her family and friends. That's it. You haven't heard anything about the defendant that makes her exceptional in any way. You have the defendant's personnel file. It's been marked into evidence introduced by the defense. Look at it. Look at her commendations. What are they? Does it say anywhere in there, oh, Stephanie Lazarus caught a serial killer. Oh, Stephanie Lazarus solved a murder case. No. Stephanie Lazarus helped out with a barbecue. Stephanie Lazarus helped out at a golf tournament. I don't want to be cruel, but at best she was a B. Nothing exceptional. It would take several days of deliberation before the jury would return a guilty verdict for the conviction of first-degree murder. She would be described as having profound narcissism that not only motivated her to kill, but continued to fuel her outright denial of any responsibility. Sherry's family members would share their impact statements. Finally, after all this time and all this waiting, speaking aloud into fruition the closure that they had so desperately fought for. John, too, would stumble his way through a prepared statement that felt like half eulogy, half apology. The loss of love still so palpable. Um, There are really no words that can describe the loss of Sherry and the whole of of this experience. 
so it makes no sense to talk very long. It suffices to say that the Rasmussen family, my family, and Stephanie's family have been thrust into a bizarre world of disbelief and indescribable sadness. Sherry Rasmussen had a profound impact on so many people. And I was proud that she agreed to be my wife. It was impossible not to notice Sherry when she entered a room. I can clearly remember the first moment I laid eyes on her. Sherry Rasmussen was a physical presence and my heart still races when I look at pictures of her. But Sherry was extraordinary, more for who she was than the way she looked. She was a hard worker, a consummate professional, a leader, a diplomat, forgiving, tough, and a kid at heart. Sherry's loss, the way she died, and the trial 25 years after her death has had a profound impact on many, many others. The effects are broad and span a generation, creating pain for those whose lives should have never been touched by this tragic event. Again, words are feeble tools for describing these impacts, but there are so many moments and so very many tears, and the fact that Sherry's death occurred because she met and married me brings me to my knees. Stephanie Lazarus was sentenced to 27 years to life in prison and currently resides at the California Institution for Women in Corona. With credit given for time served before her trial, she will be eligible for parole in 2034. Stephanie Lazarus retired early from the LAPD in 2010 instead of an official termination. She retained her full benefits from working as an officer for 25.68 years on the force, Even when convicted of heinous crimes, police pensions often remain untouchable. Stephanie's benefits work out to around $70,000 a year. Both the Rasmussen family and Jennifer Francis would file lawsuits against the LAPD. Nels and Loretta raised the issue of missing information from Sherry's file, including vital information from both John and Nels about Stephanie. Unfortunately, the statute of limitations prevented them from filing anything after 1998. Francis's whistleblower lawsuit would cite alleged misconduct on behalf of the LAPD. She claimed that not only in the Rasmussen case, but other high-profile cases, she was purposely ignored when it came to DNA evidence. She also claimed that she and other criminalists would deal with harassment and feared retaliation from higher-ups because of trying to report results that went against previously established suspects or theories. She believed she'd been taken off of certain cases in the past for similar reasons. This only intensified after her involvement on the Lazarus case. In 2017, Superior Court Judge Michael Johnson ruled that Francis could proceed to trial for a violation of state labor law, but that there was no grounds for her claims of harassment, discrimination, or retaliation. In 2019, a jury would rule in favor of the city, and Stephanie would file an appeal in May 2013, arguing that the judge had erred on his rulings. A panel of three judges would hear oral arguments in June 2015, but unanimously uphold the conviction. She also attempted to get the California Supreme Court to review her case, but it declined. The Rasmussen case would shake the airwaves and continue to have all the prime ingredients for something that sounds more like fiction than fact. A deadly love triangle, a dirty cop who practically got away with murder, and all the things that fell into place to allow that to happen. The systems established that sweep ugly secrets under the rug, away from the exposing daylight. What used to be a wild notion that would play out on a silver screen is now a common occurrence. The cinematic show distracting you with bright lights and loud noise, but what's left underneath is actually all too ordinary a story. When a collective becomes only as strong and reliable as its biggest flaw, how do we start over? Scrap it all and begin from scratch? Or take what works and toss the rest? The conviction of Stephanie Lazarus for the murder of Sherry Rasmussen is a copy of a copy another notch in the belt of fractured forces put into power. Not some monster under the bed, but a smiling face hiding in plain sight. We demand answers to questions they cannot answer. And so we wait. And we try to believe again. And we hope to God we'll see it next time. Nels and Loretta could finally stop wondering. They could stop pouring salt into the raw flesh of memories, waiting for the closure they knew had been out there all along. They could return now with a bittersweet sense of peace to their daughter. The smell of her perfume, the echo of her laugh, the sound of her voice.
The loss of a child bears no reasoning, even when the phrase are tied. Every day, that loss still exists, just in different shapes, disrupting the most mundane moments with grief unexpectedly. Arranged and rearranged, time and time again. There is a slight softening to the pain, eventually, making tiny slices of joy even more exhilarating and giving, forgetting like an indulgence, or sometimes the only way you can come up for air. The not knowing is the hardest, but somehow you manage to hold on to hope like a story you've heard a hundred times before. And I'll wait for you to tell it a hundred times more. Someday. Somewhere. When we meet again. <laughs>